recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. The cream of the crop. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil and joining me in the studio uh, right to my uh, right is Jeff. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing today, Neil? I'm doing all right. Actually, I lied. It's terrible outside. It is. And and it's making me sad. Yeah, we we have a blizzard today in Chicago. It's (laughs) it's mid-April. Uh, I, I took a nice ride along the, the lake shore uh, yesterday. It was 55 degrees out mm-hmm. today, 30, 30 degrees and blizzing outside. Yeah, about three inches Just, of snow so far. Yeah. Yeah. I was and in a t-shirt yesterday. Wet and, and gross and disgusting. Boots today. I, uh, you know, I don't mind Chicago winter when I think it's supposed to be Chicago winter, but come on, let's get a move on. Yeah, it's a little depressing out there, but, uh, you know, raising our moods, our, our special guest that we have uh, coming to us from over over Skype. Our, our first guest is someone who we had uh, been trying to get on the show for a long time, but uh, just schedules didn't work out. Uh, it was an Intercontinental Champion on Patreon, uh, and we appreciate his support, and that's Taylor Cook from Boston. How's it going, Taylor? How's it going, guys? I'm pretty hey, good. Pretty good. A lot better weather here than I think you guys are having, so not not upset by that they at all. You said it was like so. 70 yesterday? Yeah, yesterday I think it's in the 60s today, but um, a little cloudy, but no no snow at all. So. A little cloudy, I, I'd take that <laughs> any day. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I'm uh, I am in Boston. I'm originally from Iowa, which Neil and I chatted about earlier because we both went to the University of Iowa. Go Hawks! Go Hawks! Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm out. I'm actually a, a dentist, and I'm doing um, a two-year residency out here in Boston. So, I'm just out here for a couple of years. Um, yeah. So that's that's really me. Uh, I hope we haven't said any anti-dentite things on the show before. <laughs> you know, you know, even if you had, it's not anything I'm I'm not used to hearing. So, I mean, it's it's. I think it's what the second most common fear in the U.S. behind public speaking is do you have, going to the dentist. Do so. you have any weirdo patients who just love going to the dentist? Steve Martin. I didn't. Uh, I mean, yeah. I didn't. I, I didn't mean to say weirdo. No, 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 no. You, uh, no, actually, I don't think I've met anyone who's like, man, this is my favorite part of my day. No, but uh, well, Taylor, uh, we were telling Taylor before we started, and we'll let him uh, get to uh, how he found the show. But he might be the best dressed guest we've ever had on the show over <laughs> Skype. He's got a nice blazer on, nice dress shirt, perfectly coiffed hair, good teeth, good teeth. So <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that's the quality I, I try to imbue. Um, so yeah, I found the show actually. Uh, I used to listen to when I first moved out to Boston. I have like a forty-five minute commute right now, which I was not used to being from small town in the midwest uh so i listened to like a couple of trivia podcasts like uh stuff you should know or like i think there's one called like things you never knew you never knew or something like mm-hmm. that and one day I, it just said suggested for you and you guys were like right at the top and uh i was like all right so i, I clicked on it and started listening and then got hooked and then didn't stop listening and uh that got me through getting used to commuting significant amount of time um well great so glad day. so glad we were able to pick you up and uh glad yeah. to have you on the show too and i'm glad the algorithms are working for us and it's not just like word of mouth anymore too that was the first time i've ever been happy to hear an algorithm did its job yeah there you go usually yeah. it just terrifies me that uh, tarot card reader was right i mean she said the algorithms <laughs> would come in line in tune so <laughs> Uh, and uh, to introduce our special guest host, it was someone that we had the pleasure of uh, sharing some food and drink with and playing trivia uh, last week, and that's Dave Nelson from New York. How's it going, Dave? It's going well. How are you guys? Good. Good to see you again, especially in Good such close you. proximity. <laughs> Indeed. It was, uh, it was uh, a real honor to be able to uh, visit uh, Chicago and uh, cause you all to lose uh, in trivia night on Monday. Oh, we got second place, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, and we, yeah, we would have won. We got the points stolen from us from it's another like, team. Uh, let's sure. be honest. Yeah, it's the game format, not you. Um, David, you're also a, a supporter on Patreon at the United States Champion level, and, and we appreciate that. And uh, you uh, put together a game for us today, so we we thank you for that. I, I did. I, I this is the third time I've had a chance to to host a game. The, the first time um, was pretty hard, I think. Uh, the second one was a little bit easier. We'll see where this one falls, but uh, it should be similar. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I know you mentioned there could be a Jean-Claude Van Damme reference in there. Um, but uh, before we get started, uh, Matt is not here. You didn't hear his voice. And uh, Taylor actually had a uh, a line on where Matt might be. Where Where is that, Taylor? Yeah, well, so Matt actually, Matt actually texted me um, 
Little little known. I've I've actually known Matt since uh, we were we were born uh, in the same hospital, same day. Oh. Um, yeah. So he actually he texts me from here to there. Um, he's actually in China right now. He's uh, trying to break the world record for fastest pogo sticking uh, along the wall. So. Oh. Um, yeah, working out those quads, um, getting ready for uh, for some spring intramurals. So. Gotcha. Yeah, that sounds. I, like I didn't Matt. actually know that. He did not text me. I didn't. Well, you weren't born in the same hospital. No, right. We're not that close. You didn't get cell phone numbers immediately after birth. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, well, we're, uh, we're sure that Matt is uh, lamenting at the uh, poor stonework of the uh, Great Wall of China as he's pogo sticking. Uh, so we'll we'll get him back another time. But uh, let's uh, throw it to the rules guy before we get started. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, Someone will be named the cream of the crop. The cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, well, it looks like uh, today's teams are going to be Jeff and Ken, who don't often get to play together, but since they have uh, such uh, different personalities that uh, are a yin and yang to each other, they're going to be ice and fire today. Yeah, and, and, and we're enjoying that, that Game of Thrones season that's currently airing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to partner with uh, Taylor. He's a little bit more of a Jeff uh, as far as his trivia knowledge goes so i'm happy to partner with him and hopefully pull in that pop culture uh, and i and uh taylor why don't you say what our team name is uh so so since neil and i both went to the the university of iowa a little iowa connection there as uh, a play on the uh the cream of the crop in the field of dreams in dyersville iowa will be the field of creams field uh, of i don't creams. know if i want to see that field <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to build that field if you build it they will drip uh, don't, okay i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, Dave, that you have to deal with this, but uh, but I'm, we're sure that your game is going to be amazing. So take it away. What, what were we we were talking about the Pornhub categories? Is that <laughs> yeah. no? That was episode one hundred. Oh, sorry. This has nothing to All do right. with. Uh... <laughs> if you're ready, uh, let's go to round one, question one. All right. So y you probably know producer and director Chris Columbus from uh, the Home Alone movies, a couple of the Harry Potter movies, Miss Doubtfire. Um, but one of his earliest jobs in film was writing the script for which 1984 comedy horror classic, which featured performances from Howie Mandel, Corey Feldman, and Jonathan Banks of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame, and which used the following tagline, cute, clever, mischievous, intelligent, dangerous. Okay, I think we'll lock in uh, right away here. Cool. So, um, yeah, Howie Mandel um, did a lot of voice work, uh, and in this movie he did voice work, and it would be the Christmas slash horror classic Gremlins. Ooh, I was not expecting that. I was I, I went with uh, Little Monsters. Well, they were Little Monsters, that's for sure, but uh, more commonly known by the actual title of the film, uh, which is Gremlins. Did Howie Mandel do the Gremlin voices? He he did the main um, oh, main voice. Yeah, God. he was Gizmo. Gizmo, yeah. All right. Question two. Uh, speaking of Columbus, everyone knows about the 1892-1893 Columbian Exposition, which was the subject of Eric Larson's outstanding book, The Devil in the White City. That event held in Chicago to celebrate the quadricentennial of Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World was actually the second World's Fair to take place on American soil. The first was held 16 years earlier, when nearly 10 million visitors came to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the country's founding. The fairgrounds, consisting of over 200 specially built structures, a few of which survive until, until today, were located in Fairmount Park, in which city? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and lock in, based on uh, based on Jeff's best guess on this one. How do you feel about this one, Taylor? I'm not too sure. The only other thing I could think would be like I don't know, New York or something. I I, I don't know. Yeah, New York makes sense. I mean, it was around at that time. It, it was probably thriving. Uh, for some reason, St. Louis is coming into my head, but I, I sure. That... Oh yeah, yeah, the the Arch maybe. Um, yeah, and I don't know if that was for the Olympics or if that was for a World's Fair, but I feel like that was. Um, I, I would be I would be okay with that as an answer. Yeah. Are you, you're okay with that? Okay, it's a complete guess because yeah. this isn't my sure. area. But uh, yeah, let's do that. We'll lock in with St. Louis. I was thinking that the St. Louis one was later, 
Um, that was what I was getting hung up on. So uh, Ken and I decided that uh, maybe uh, it would be in the original capital. We said Philadelphia. Well, Fairmount Park is a very large and very beautiful park uh, located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm. Nice. That makes nice sense. Pull. Yeah, some lucky guessing there. All right, question three. Speaking of Philadelphia, in 2018, that city served as the final venue for a U.S. tour of which band, co-founded by guitarist and singer Jeff Lynne, which had a big impact on the U.S. charts in the 1970s, scoring 15 top 20 singles, the biggest of which, Don't Bring Me Down, went all the way to number four in late 1979. We are locked in. Yep. Yeah, this is a total Jeff question. Um, do you have any idea on this one, Taylor? The, uh, Jeff Lynn, I believe, was the guy from the, uh, I can't remember if it's the Wilderberries or the Wild Thornberries, but... Um, <laughs> do, you mean, do you mean the Traveling Wilberries? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that name sounds very familiar to me, but I'm, I'm not drawing a band. Was um, he in the Traveling Wilberries? He was. Um, so I believe, if I'm correct, uh, the song that Dave was referencing is uh, Don't Bring Me Down, 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 Down. And I believe that's ELO, I think. Um, yeah, let's go with that. Okay. Um, now I'm not feeling like Mr. Blue Sky. So uh, we said Electric Light Orchestra. <laughs> yeah, a couple of my friends went to that tour when Electric it was in Light Chicago. Orchestra. Yep, you got it right. It's the Electric Light Orchestra or ELO. Now, Dave, do you prefer ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra, or OMD, the Orchestral Movements in the Dark? No, or OM, in the dark? OMD was the Ozark Martin Daredevils, who had the song Jackie Blue, Neil, obviously. I'm talking about If You Leave from Pretty in Pink. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, guys. Uh, question number four. Speaking of ELO, the band had another top ten U.S. hit in 1980 with the title track from the soundtrack for Xanadu an unbelievably convoluted film starring Olivia Newton-John. The film took its title from the poem Kubla Khan, published in 1816 by which English poet, who also wrote The Rime of the Ancient Mariner and spent virtually his entire adult life addicted to opium. Well, that could have been anyone. Okay, so <laughs> I asked a question about... The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on episode one of yes. Triviality. Yeah, your first round was all nautical themed. Yeah, and I'm just trying to remember the poet's name, which, oh man. I, I'm probably not going to pull it. I, every time I hear Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, I only think of uh, Iron Maiden because I know they did a song to that, but I know it's, you know, I, yeah. can, I can never think of it. So um, do you know any old English poems you want you would want to lock in with or or no? <laughs> I mean, I could make up an English-sounding last name that could, you know, pass as a poet, but I, I don't. I can't think of a. Yeah, do that. Any. Let's let's lock in with your your English-sounding name, and we'll let All these right. guys talk it out. You have a letter that's sticking in mind. I just want to say like Hook or something like that. It could or... be Hook. Yeah, that sounds somewhat familiar. I don't think it's right, but let's just say Hook. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna Ambrose Bierce this one. I can't. Out of it. I can't Ambrose Bierce this. Oh, one. <laughs> that was that was one of the greatest polls in the history of the show. I think. Which is why we left it in. Usually yeah. they're not very good. Usually it's just coincidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna go with Hook. And, and we'll go with a similarly uh, short sounding name of Kent. Well, um, I'm curious, Ken. Does it? The name Samuel Taylor Coleridge ring a bell? Yeah, it sure does. All right, question five. Speaking of Khans, Imran Khan was elected Prime Minister of Pakistan in 2018. Politics is actually Khan's second career. He earlier spent over 20 years as a professional in which sport? All right, uh, Jeff's handed me a piece of paper with a word written on it, and uh, we'll go with that. The password is... Watermelon. Um, so Taylor, I think uh, I have a feeling he was in cricket. That's what exactly what I was going to say too. I know that's a popular sport in that part of the world. So um, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna go with cricket as well. Cool. Well, yeah, let's lock it in. And uh, we two went cricket. All right, guys. Full points. The answer is the sport of cricket. Nice. Looks like after five questions, uh, which I am enjoying the stream of consciousness uh, nature of them, uh, we have 30 points. How about you guys? We also have 30 points. All right. Ice and fire, yep. 30 points. And uh, field of creams, 30 mm. points. Very, yes. very zen. All right. All right. Question six. Speaking of cricket, which of the following is not an actual term used in cricket? 
a slog sweep, a dibbly dobbly, a lobster kettle, a perhapser, or a Nelson. What do you think? I, I think this is pretty much a toss up. So let's think, just go ahead and talk I think about it. Yeah. I think a dibbly dobbly is one because it's weird. The one, the one that I don't. <clears throat> and and it might I might just be having a wrong hunch, but perhaps her is the one that seemed weird to me. Nelson. I don't seems... think I don't think uh, Dave's making up perhaps her. No, and I don't think he's making up Nelson, which I think is you know would be would be funny. Um, it's a lobster kettle. I think I think I feel like I've heard lobster kettle before. So what was the first one he said? There's dibbly dobbly, and uh, I don't know what was the first one. What was the first it was one? Dave? Slog, slog something. Slog, slog sweep. All right, th- we'll go with slog sweep. I feel like there is a sweep though. So know. we've eliminated all, all the of answers. Them. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> They're all cricket terms. <laughs> F- pick one. <laughs> you can, I mean, what, so which one do you think? Because you're right. I it's said dibbly dobbly. Dibbly dobbly. Fine. We'll go with that one. How are you feeling, Taylor? Because initially, when I hear dibbly dobbly, I can see a, an upper crust British man uh, in the in the stands going, "Oh, quite a nice dibbly dobbly." And so that it's one makes nice sense to me. Dibbly dobbly, yeah, right after a perfect swag. Wait, what about uh, what does uh, Jimmy Bose think of that? <laughs> oh, wait, resurrecting Jimmy Bose. What does huh? Jimmy Bose think of the? Uh, He's not the, high class enough for dobbly. cricket. <laughs> yeah, watch I, cricket. Oh, bro, it's like a dibbly dobbly, yeah. You gotta go watch football, mate. You can't watch cricket. Cricket's no man's game. Um, <laughs> get your is stick it, and hit the ball. Nelson right? is a Nelson some kind of a wrestling term or well, something there, like that? Yeah, so there's Nelson, like a Nelson half. half Nelson. Really? Yeah, there's a half Nelson uh, and a full Nelson. Um, so I thought maybe he might throw that in as like a I don't know because because you guys talk about wrestling a lot. I don't know. I know I had the same thought, and I thought that if he put Nelson in there, it was either real and he did it to trick us because his name is nelson or it's completely fabricated oh. um so i don't it just depends on how how much you think he's going to trick us there i don't know I, i'd say we don't read into it too much and just go with that on the toss-up <laughs> yeah let's do it let's go with uh let's go with nelson of the three-quarter variety so was that one dibbly dobbly and one nelson yes right. and that's to go yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's funny you should say that you you, you thought of an an upper class uh englishman pronouncing the word dibbly dobbly because every time i say that in my head i can think of nobody other than uh ned flanders oh, oh dibbly dobbly <laughs> exactly now, the correct answer is a lobster kettle mm. um, which is uh, a slang term from the 18th century for a woman of loose morals who was known to uh shall we say cavort with uh, soldiers well that's why uh, i've heard of it a lobster yeah. kettle put a lot of uh, <laughs> wow. a lot of lobsters in her kettle i guess yeah. the slog sweep is is some sort of like hyper aggressive shot where the guy actually tries to smash the ball over his own shoulder somehow uh, a dibbly dobbly is kind of a, a slow bowler a perhaps there is kind of a risky shot and a nelson is a score of 111 uh, which is theorized to refer somehow to Admiral Horatio Nelson, who had uh, only one arm and one uh, functioning eye. Okay, I'd call that a bill. Well, uh, but seems like the whole uh, the whole sport makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of lobsters, <laughs> it makes sense why Jack the Ripper was not a fan of seafood. <laughs> speaking of Horatios, question seven. <laughs> okay. In Shakespeare's twenty fourth play, the character Horatio enters early in the first scene walking along the castle ramparts and bumping into the ghost of the recently murdered father of which title character. Okay, we're locked in. Uh, to lock in or not to lock in? That is the question, Taylor. Yep. Um, uh, I believe it's Hamlet. Yeah, I believe, okay. I think Horatio features as a skull uh, for the most part in this uh, play. So we're going to go with Hamlet. Yep. That's an easy one. You guys both got it. Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Good job. It's his skull, right? Well, he has, yeah, and he actually also cameoed in Captain Marvel as a scroll. Oh. <laughs> Jeff just shaking his head. <laughs> uh. All right, question eight. Speaking of Denmark, Torsvon is the capital city of which country located in the North Atlantic, which, although autonomous, is technically still controlled by Denmark? So I think uh, Greenland... 
has a I asked a question about the capital and there's actually two names for it. Okay. I think this might be the second name for it. Oh, an alternate name because yeah. it's I know it's not the the name I had in mind because that's like a Nook or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that definitely is an island control. I think it has Denmark. two names though. Okay. Well, if that's what you think, then I'm happy to go with it. I've got no other. I couldn't think of any other islands they owned in All right. the North Atlantic. So, so it is Greenland. Yeah. So I, uh, my dad has this really old globe um, from like the 70s or something that I remember looking at as a kid. Uh, and it has a lot of countries with names that are no longer their name. I think uh, if I remember correctly, Thailand is still called Siam on that, um, on that globe. And if I remember correctly, I thought Greenland said something on the country since it's so huge about being uh, – property of denmark so unless i'm completely wrong i i think that that might be the right answer yeah i trust you yeah denmark is uh greenland is controlled by denmark uh but i was thinking of a different country uh, a much 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 smaller country called the faroe islands mm. oh oh is that faroe with an f yes it is yeah, F-A-R-E. yeah. yeah okay. is that where mia comes from <laughs> jeez um well um it- <laughs> If that's the sort of pun you're going to stoop to, um, you'll like, uh, me you'll like where I'm going. <laughs> oh, good, good. Uh, question nine. Speaking of pharaohs, avant-garde jazz saxophonist Pharaoh Sanders is perhaps best known by Stone College students for his killer 32-minute jam, The Creator Has a Master Plan. But Sanders got his first big break in 1965 when he joined the band of which legendary jazz musician who tragically died of liver cancer only two years later at the age of 40, just a few months before the release of his final album, Expression. I think Coltrane made it Coltrane, later. Coltrane, uh, Miles. Miles made it later. Okay. Miles Thelonious. Later. Monk's not a bad one. I was thinking about, uh, I'm trying to remember specifically, I remember somebody had liver cancer. and I don't remember if it was like Dizzy Gillespie or if it was like Dexter Gordon or... Um, I don't think the answer is going to be too obscure here. So let's say Monk. I'm okay with Thelonious Monk. I don't remember him being that long lived, but I I could be totally wrong. Okay. Uh, anything on this one, Taylor? Uh, no, I mean they said a lot of the names I was thinking. Um, whenever I hear jazz, I just think of that line from uh, Billy Madison where the the That's little old jazz. lady says, "If pee in your pants is cool, then consider me Miles Davis." And <laughs> I always think of that, but. Uh, well, pee in your pants is the coolest. Um, well, well, I think Miles Davis was the birth of cool. Neil, so, so Miles Davis, yeah. w- when he first said the word expression, I thought of Miles Davis, but I yeah. couldn't remember when he died. I feel like it was much later than 67. Right. I was pretty sure Bitches Brew came out in 70. Um, but uh, Jeff keeps helping our team out. It's great. I- I'm kind of at a loss. I- who are you leaning towards? Miles Davis, even though we think it might be wrong? Yeah, that's whatever. All right. Yeah, let's just let's just go with it because I- I'm not too sure, sure on my end. So these guys with Miles Davis, and we're going to stick with Thelonious Monk. Well, that was, uh, Jeff, for somebody who didn't get the right answer, that was uh, an awful lot of impressive jazz knowledge demonstrated in the talk through. Um, You guys both uh, mentioned the correct answer, but neither one of you quite landed on it. It's John Coltrane. Ah. Oh, no. That was my bad. I should have pushed stronger for that. That's all good. I I couldn't remember for sure. I knew he wasn't older. I thought he was like mid forties, and I couldn't remember if it was cancer or not. I guess John Coltrane wasn't one of your favorite things after all. He was, but I just didn't remember that. All right, question ten. Uh, also speaking of Pharaoh, it was the name of one of the most popular nineteenth-century gambling card games. Mm-hmm. Dealing Pharaoh was an early profession for which Old West dentist and gunfighter. <laughs> Famously wounded in 1861 during the gunfight at the OK Corral. All right. We are in. Oh, wait a minute. When I when I think of OK Corral, for some reason, I'm thinking Wyatt Earp, but um, I could be wrong. What about uh, uh, what about Amya Huckleberry? Doc Holliday? <laughs> Doc Holliday. Um, I don't know if he was a dentist, though. He was wounded. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I was really hoping there would be some kind of dentistry adjacent question but this was not the <laughs> tangent i was hoping for taylor uh, as we pick an answer here would you rather be a dentist now with old instruments or a <laughs> dentist in the old west with modern instruments oh old west well you might be tried as a witch i guess if you had 
modern instruments. <laughs> what is this um, X-ray machine? Yeah. <laughs> speaking of, uh, you can see inside my body. <laughs> speaking of uh, jazz, I'm pretty sure the dentists back then were pretty much playing jazz in people's mouths too, <laughs> just trying to figure out what the what the hell to do. Um, you know, I'm not too yeah. sure. I, I love the movie Tombstone, um, which is you know about OK Corral, and I'm I'm kind of going through all the characters and. Uh, I don't know if it's one of the main ones. Doc Holliday just comes to me because he was uh, wounded, but I mean, he was kind of a, a drunk. I don't even know if he was a dentist or I think his name actually was Doc, but uh, I don't know. We can go with whatever you feel. Sounds right. It's a shame because I do like Old West history. Um, I don't think Doc Holliday is correct, but um, just for the fact that Val Kilmer is amazing in that movie, and if you happen to uh, <laughs> yeah. Google... Very sweaty. Very sweaty. If you happen to Google... Uh, tombstone review I, I don't know what the name of it is it's like the most recent youtube guy went insane and said it was the greatest movie of all time it was a great review um anyway you want to go just go with doc holiday uh sure okay all right these guys are going with uh, val kilmer i'm writing down uh walt disney's last words and uh we're going with kurt russell as white Earp. Well, Wyatt Earp was there for sure, um, but the answer is John Henry Holiday, better known as Doc Holiday. Oh, good wow, job, nice guys. Call, Neil. Oh, I, I thought his name actually was Doc, so that's good. I'm glad I learned something there. And no, he he really was a dentist, or uh, what passed for a dentist in the <laughs> which was anyone who claimed to be a dentist, really. Yeah. Well, well, that I mean that tells you what what was required of dentists that you right. could also be a gunfighter and yeah. a arrow dealer. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, after the first round, looks like Field of Creams has pulled a slight lead with 50 points. Uh, we kind of had a losing streak going at the end of that round, uh, so we only pulled 40 for the round. All right, guys, swing round today. The category is country music. Oh, no. Great. Right. Excellent. Yay. Oh, good LOL. for you, Taylor. So I'm going to give a list of 10 musicians, uh, five points each. Very simply, I need each musician's country of birth. Mm. If I name a band, then all members of the band were born in the same country. Okay, this is a lot better than I imagined. <laughs> Number one, uh, bassist and lead creepy guy from Kiss, Gene Simmons. Number two, Tommy Lee, drummer for Motley Crue. Number three, Nicki Minaj. Number four, Shakira. Number five, The Weeknd. Number six, Daft Punk. Number seven, Toby Keith. Number eight, Keith Urban. Number nine, Eddie Van Halen. And number ten, Sia. Looks like uh, after some discussion, all the answers were locked in. But uh, this is harder than I thought, actually. Yeah, there are some good ones. Yeah. Uh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um all right, uh, number one, Gene Simmons. What did you guys put? We thought uh, Israel for him. Yeah, we thought the same thing. Uh, I've heard him talk about Israel quite a lot, so that's the answer we liked in with. And you're both right. It's Israel. Number two, Tommy Lee. Well, uh, Jeff and I discussed. We know he dated uh, Pamela Anderson, who's Canadian, so we said he's also Canadian. You can go ahead, Taylor. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I seem to remember, I just recently watched the movie the dirt on netflix and i could have sworn that at his mom was speaking like greek or something and they were talking something about greece uh, i could be completely wrong um but uh so we went with uh, greece well you're completely correct tommy lee was born in greece oh sweet nice great poll taylor thanks all right number three Nicki minaj uh we uh, we didn't know so we said uh, the u.s we thought there had to be one of those on this list uh, yeah, this one, uh, we, we didn't have, you know, too much to go on. Taylor had brought up uh, Trinidad and Tobago. So we just thought, you know, that kind of sounded right. So that's what we went with. Well, that's a superb guess because it's correct. Nicki Minaj wow. was born in Trinidad. Yeah, as soon as they said it, I was like, oh, that's oh it. man, great poll again. Yeah, you never I, heard I saw that. you sit down and shake your head and you're like, yeah, yeah, so. All right, speaking of shaking, number four, Shakira. <laughs> the hips don't lie uh, down in Colombia. Yeah, Taylor and I went back and forth a long time in this one. And Taylor, what was the song that we were singing again? Because I think that's what clued you into the answer. Oh, I don't, I don't remember. You, you, you have to start it off for me. You're like, <laughs> Ooh, baby, when you talk like that, you <laughs> may make a woman go mad. They both have a pretty good impression there. 
<laughs> no, we well, went with Columbia as well. Yeah, as, as as strongly inclined as I am to take away points for that performance. <laughs> I, you, I mean, feel free. Yeah, it would born. help us. <laughs> yeah, she was born in Columbia. I, I'd love right. to. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say I'd love to see her order coffee, and she actually sounds like that, like the way she sings. I take my coffee black. <laughs> No sugar, no cream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was hoping for. And okay. this is the last episode. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> thank, thank you. Sorry, Shakira fans. And uh, Wyclef, Sean, uh, we're here for you. All right, guys. Number five, The weekend. Where was he born? Again, uh, this one was just kind of a, a random toss-up, so we said USA. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Taylor. Yeah, we went... Um, I... I guess we were kind of inclined to think that a lot of these weren't from the U.S. Um, and for some reason, we just decided to go with the Dominican Republic. Uh, he was actually born in Canada. Mm. There's ah, the Canadian oh, okay. one. Makes, yeah. See, we thought we had already used up our Canada. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Number six, Daft Punk. Oh, yeah. There's only one place to come from if you're as eccentric, weird, and electronic as this band. Hey, what was that answer one more time? It's France. Yep, we said France. Uh, there would be no justice without Daft Punk, so that's why we went with France. Well, for me, uh, you know, eccentric plus weird plus electronic equals Germany for sure, but the answer here is France. Yeah, th- no, that's fair. Yeah. All right, number seven, Toby Keith. Well, uh, I know he plays uh, American flag uh, guitar sometimes, <laughs> and he owns a string of sh- restaurants <laughs> so there's nothing more american than that so we said the good old us of a uh, you could take it taylor yeah we, we said the united states as well although as we were kind of locking in i was like oh god we didn't say canada and i swear someone's from canada so unless he's a really good actor we but yeah we put us as well yeah this one's uh, easy i just thought it'd be hilarious if i could trick somebody into saying he was from somewhere else uh, yeah <laughs> He, he was he was born the hell out of the USA, for sure. <laughs> All right, number eight, uh, Keith Urban. Uh, this guy is married to Nicole Kidman, and I think they're both Australian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's got the, uh, the the blonde hair and the, and the looks of an Australian, so we went Australia as well. He but looks, not for those reasons. He looks, like, reason. he looks like Chris Gaines. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, I guess. But he's serious. He looks, uh, I mean, he's a very good looking man. I'm not going to disparage that. But he almost looks like the model version of a rusted yellow leather belt. <laughs> 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 if it were a man. If this was a a belt, you know, a bedazzled belt turned into a man like a princess story. Well, you know, I, I, I used to live in Hollywood, uh, California, in L.A. And if you go to the farmer's market there on a Sunday morning, there's like 700 guys that look exactly like that. <laughs> um, th- this was a little bit of a trick. He was actually, uh, um, although grew up in Australia, he was born in New Zealand. No. Oh, that's no. painful. That's going to screw our last one. That's painful. Eddie Van Halen, number nine. I thought he was from the U.K., but we could be wrong on that. Now the list is kind of screwed up. Yeah. The way that we've discovered answers. So who knows? My favorite song is Eruption by Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> uh, he's from the <laughs> Netherlands. Yeah, that's absolutely right. He was born in the Netherlands. Oh, God. I see why you pocketed that one now. You yeah. wanted to pull out the Dutch boy. <laughs> I mean, I guess it makes sense with like the Van Halen, but I, you know, you could be uh, from anywhere. Oh, true. I yeah. didn't think about that. Uh, number 10, uh, Sia. South Africa. <laughs> Uh, I was almost positive she was either Australian or New Zealand or New or from New Zealand, and um, and then we said, well, Keith Urban, we have Australia, so it must be New Zealand. So we went with New Zealand, uh, even though now it makes sense that she's probably Australian. Yep, you'll pay five points for that mistake. She was born in Australia. Shucks. After that uh, shocking swing round, quite frankly, uh, looks like we picked up twenty points, bringing Ice and Fire's score to sixty. Field of Creams did uh, slightly better on that, picking up thirty-five points bringing them to 85. Are right, you guys ready for round two? Indeed. Yeah, I think so. We're more than ready. <laughs> All right, round two, question one. HSBC, headquartered in London, is the world's seventh largest bank by total assets and was founded in 1865 by Scottish politician Sir Thomas Sutherland, who got his start in business as a clerk for the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation Company. The B stands for banking and the C stands for corporation. Duh. What do the H and S stand for? Full points for either correct answer. 
Okay, we'll lock in. He's, he said he was Scottish? Yes. Or something, so I thought maybe the S would be, like, <laughs> Scottish. I, I don't know. Um, and maybe, I don't know, just because it's funny, I was thinking Highlander, but uh, just because I like that movie. Well, there's only one. Yeah, there is. Um, so maybe, yeah, like Heritage. Or, or Highland, or yeah. Highland. Highland of Scotland. I don't know. How about instead of Highlander, we go with Heritage, Heritage Scotland. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Cool. All right, we're gonna lock in with that. So I know I know they're a London bank, but I'm pretty sure HSBC is huge in China because I'm pretty sure that the um, trading port that was used uh, for a lot of this was in Hong Kong. So we, th- I think the H stands for Hong Kong. All right. Well, there was a little bit of a clue um, when I said that the uh, founder had had worked for the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation ah. Company. Uh, so the H and the S respectively stand for Hong Kong and, and Shanghai. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That's good fact. Good fact. Yeah. Good that's job, cool. Jeff. That's a good question. All right. Question number two. Uh, speaking of banks. The Grand Banks of Newfoundland are a critical spawning, nursery, and feeding area for a wide variety of fish species, including the Atlantic cod. The so-called sacred cod is a 4-foot, 11-inch carved wooden effigy of an Atlantic codfish that hangs from the ceiling in which state's legislative chamber. The current cod was installed in 1784, the previous version having disappeared during the American Revolution. We are going to lock in. I don't know. He said something about the American Revolution, right? So it should be an old state. Um, I mean, older state. So like Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I like that train of thought. Um, well, um, I mean, they do like seafood out here in Massachusetts, but the whole area. Uh, I mean, simply just because it's called the ocean state, I'm leaning towards Rhode Island, but I could see it being Massachusetts, too. I'm being rather indecisive, I guess. Let's just go with Rhode Island. All right, that was my answer. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, we a, went. They have a cape named Cod. Yeah. So well, maybe they have a giant effigy of one. That that's a good. Uh, that's so a we good. said Massachusetts. Yeah. Well, well, one of us uh, on this uh, game is actually within sniffing distance of the sacred cod because it hangs uh, in Massachusetts. Shucks. Don't call it a comeback. Don't call it a cod back. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> gotcha. I've been here for years. <laughs> don't call don't call it a cod back. All right, question three. Speaking of gigantic fish sculptures hanging from ceilings, while the sacred cod hangs in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, the Massachusetts State Senate, amazingly enough, has its own ichthyological icon, which dangles from a chandelier and has been nicknamed the Holy Mackerel. During World War II, lawmakers actually debated donating the mackerel to the war effort. Can you tell me of what metal, whose atomic number is 13, and which comprises approximately 1.6% of the Earth by mass, is the holy mackerel made? What? No. Whatever your answer is, you lock in. No. (laughs) Unless it's right. right, You lock in, then. Yeah, we're locked in. You're the science guy, Taylor. I'm just going to let you think about number 13, because when I hear holy yeah, mackerel... So, good. so 10, 10's neon, 11, I believe, is sodium and or potassium. I, it's, I think it goes sodium and potassium. Uh, it should be 12. And then, I, I don't know, magnesium, maybe? No, that's 23, right? Or is that manganese? Or maybe I'm completely off. I have no idea. I'm just... Um, is it like, could it be copper, nickel? Um, uh, uh, actually, copper... Let's, I mean, I, I would be okay with saying copper. I don't know why I'm blanking on this. This should be something I know, but... Um, and, I mean, they used copper to make a lot of stuff, so... Okay, yeah, because I... I, I, used, I used to have a periodic table hanging on my wall, so it's actually good I don't right now, because I'd feel like I was cheating, but... And then, I mean, um, lastly, though, it wouldn't be... You can use whatever's in the room with you. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be uh, aluminum or nickel or anything, or titanium, right? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, it, uh, I feel co- like I feel like that's too light for copper. Um, but I. But again, I, I don't. I don't know. So let's let's just go with it. Okay. That's. I feel bad for taking us down this road because I don't know anything about science. But we'll go with copper. That's all good. Um, <clears throat> we went with a metal that used to be quite a bit more precious than it is now. In fact, it's so disposable we basically throw it away, and we said oh. aluminum. 
aluminum, you know. Well, I did ask, can you tell me? Uh, and the answer with that appropriate groan is aluminum. So aluminum? Nice. Aluminum. If you're so inclined, yes. I am. If you're so Britishly inclined. What do you think about that, Jimmy? Sorry, well, Rob's got some nice aluminium you've got there. <laughs> aluminium foil. Hey, that's Johnny Bose. That's my brother. <laughs> Jimmy and Johnny Bose. Oh, Jimmy. Give me five quid, I'll get you a gallon of milk there. <laughs> <laughs> five, five quid. That's a lot. All right, question four. Speaking of the number 13, that was the uniform number worn for almost his entire career. By which Venezuelan 11-time gold, wi- gold glove winning and three-time all-star shortstop, who despite playing 24 seasons with six different teams, including the Mariners, Giants, and Indians, retired after the 2012 season with a mere 80 career home runs? Ooh, I think I know it. Being, being part Indians fan, it, ca- it just came to me. <laughs> That's a weird way to phrase that. <laughs> it just came to me. I know. Well, I mean, I Indians are my favorite American League team, and then the Cubs and the National League. But I, just, I haven't followed the Indians as closely as I used to. But I'm pretty sure well, I know who it is. Any baseball player with a Venezuelan-sounding name that you can... I don't remember where Pedro throw. Martinez is from. So let's go Pedro Martinez. Good enough. Uh, he is a pitcher, but um, I believe this is uh, one of their best players they've ever had, Omar Vizquez. I'm going to have to dock points there. Um, the answer is Omar Vizquel. Oh. Uh. <laughs> is, there an, is there an Omar Vizquez? Probably somewhere in some uh, different trivia quiz. But, oh, uh, no. <laughs> Where Dang. the answers are wrong? <laughs> I mean, that's so close, though. But, yeah, that's, that's yeah, too bad. Close. All right, question five. Speaking of, in, speaking of Indians, Sitar wizard Ravi Shankar wowed the audience when he opened the third night of the Monterey Pop Festival in June 1967. And in mid-1978, he wowed a female New York City concert promoter, leading to the birth on March 30th of 1979 of which pianist and pop songstress? I like how you phrase that question, <laughs> that he wowed her. <laughs> Okay, we are just going to lock in with a guess here because we really have no idea. Any thoughts on your end? Because, uh, you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking of pop piano stars. Um, yeah. And the first two that come to my head are Alicia Keys and Sarah Bareilles. Sarah Bareilles? I, I was thinking Sarah Bareilles as well, but I'm pretty sure it's not her. Almost positive. I also thought, you know, Michelle Branch, Vanessa Carlton, I don't, I don't really think they fall into that 100% either. Um yeah, I, I'm at a loss. I, who do you want to go with? Well, since they said Alicia Keys, let's just say Sarah Bareilles, just to give it a little spice. Okay. All right, that sounds good. And as you heard, we went with Alicia Keys. And the answer is a lady who had a really huge monster record uh, probably about 15 years ago called Don't Know Why. Uh, it's Nora Jones. Oh, I didn't even oh. think of Nora Jones. Okay. I forgot about her. Wow. She hasn't really released a ton lately, right? I guess not. Well, looks like uh, after five questions in this round, Field of Creams is uh, kind of on a bit of a slide. They slipped on the cream. They're, uh, they're sliding through the field right now. Rounding uh, third, we slipped on the, the creamy third base. They're hanging out at 85 points, and we got three right in a row to start that round, so we're at 90. Oh, man, this is a tight game. All right. All right, question six. Speaking of pianists, Norwegian composer and pianist Edvard Grieg wrote music to accompany the 1876 premiere of the play Peer Gint by which playwright, also from Norway, who also wrote Hedda Gabler and A Doll's House. Yep, we're got it. We're Frankly, the in. music might be more well-known today than the play is. Cool. And we are locked in. Awesome. I know I know this, too, and it's killing me. It's not check. I don't know if it's not Chekhov, and it's not... Um, I'm thinking of the person who wrote Mother Courage, but... I don't. I think that person's German. Um, I, I don't know. Dollhouse. We can say Chekhov if you want. I think it's wrong, but yeah. Let's go with Chekhov. Why not? And if I if I'm remembering correctly, I believe this is Heinrich Ibsen. Oh. Yep. The answer is Ibsen. I knew once I heard it. All right. Question seven. Speaking of Norway, which traditional dish, popular in both Norway and the Upper Midwest of the United States? is prepared by taking dried whitefish, soaking it first in water, then in lye, then in water again, 
thereby breaking down much of its protein and giving it a jello-like consistency. Feel free to talk about Elmer's glue. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know why, uh, like, gefilte fish is coming to mind. Um, I don't think that's... That sounds like something Linda Richmond would say. Have you tried gefilte fish? It's neither fish <laughs> nor gefilte. Um, yeah, I think we should... I, I kind of like that. Why don't we go with that? All right. Yeah, let's go with gefilte fish. That's a, that's a word I've heard a lot, but I never knew what it was. Um, but we had no idea, so we went... Uh, it sounds like a fish paste, and then we settled on Elmer's glue... Well, uh, it is the Passover season, uh, so I appreciate the reference to the fish, but the correct answer here is something <laughs> called lutefisk. Lutefisk! Oh, yes, it sounds so much like it, but it's lut- that's yeah. what he was talking about, lutefisk, yeah. It, I've never had it, but it appears to be uh, almost exactly as disgusting as the fish. Now, when did when did they roll out lutefisk, okay. and in how many Fast and the Furious movies was he in? <sighs> Any, anytime I hear you turn, I know exactly where these jokes are going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number eight. Uh, speaking of Jello, 1980s Jello spokesman and serial rapist Bill Cosby, <laughs> 1978 film Sweet, which was adapted from a play by Neil Simon. Simon earlier had a different play run for over two years on Broadway in the mid 1960s, before being turned into a highly successful film and then a television series that ran for five seasons on ABC in the 1970s. What was the title of this play turned film turned TV show? All right, uh, we're gonna lock in. There's a slight rustling in the studio. I thought uh, a little bit of I a thought, creaky spring action. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought Matt was in China, but apparently he really pogo sticked his way back. Yeah, he broke the record for sure. Hey, whoa! Look who's I here? I have manifested in the studio. Interesting. It's wow. uh yeah, it's been a it's been a day. <laughs> Been a day. Matt will be here on commentary. He has no idea what's been going on, but it's a very tight game, Matt. Dave Nelson has written some really great questions. Very international flair today. Oh, good thing I wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Neil, you were in China. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Neil as, Simon. Yeah. What, what, I have no idea here. What ran, can you think of anything in the series that ran five years uh, on ABC? Uh, happy Days. No, I think that was earlier. And ran longer because they jumped the shark in season six. Partridge Family. Um, well, yeah, we can go Partridge Family. We'll okay. fine with that. Although I think it's wrong. But. So uh, Neil Simon, uh, despite spelling his first name the wrong way, uh, famous playwright, yeah. um, and you know has a theater in uh, in New York on Broadway. Uh, he's known for many, 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 many famous plays because he's an awesome writer. But I want to say, and I'm almost positive, um, I think Dave is talking about the Odd Couple. So that's what we locked in with. Yep, the TV show was uh, Jack Klugman and Tony Randall. This is The Odd Couple. Mm. Back on the board. Back on the board. Yep. Finally. There's a lot of zeros there. (laughs) 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 My expert analysis on two minutes is that's not good. (laughs) We're back, though. We're back. Uh, Question number nine. Speaking of Simons, English-born actor Simon Pegg has starred in three films directed by Edgar Wright who most recently brought us the 2017 long-form music video, Baby Driver. The three (laughs) films, which Peg also co-wrote, have jokingly come to be called the Three Flavors Cornetto Trilogy, for the brand of prepackaged ice cream cones that makes a cameo appearance in each movie. Please name any two of these three motion pictures. We're good. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we are good as well. How do you feel, Taylor? Uh... I mean, I'm pretty sure I've probably seen the movies he's talking about, but I don't know exactly what he's referring to. Um, I mean, I can name Simon Pegg movies, but I don't know exactly what he's talking about. So if you feel free to enlighten me, that would be uh, fantastic. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll let uh, Ken throw the third one uh, here, but uh, we went uh, with Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, that's, that's what a, I was going to say. That's, yep. what, that's what we officially locked in with is Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. I think the last one's... Uh... At World's End? The End of the World? No, it's World. It's just... I'm thinking of Stupid Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That always messes me up, too. I think mean, it is World's End, though. Yeah. World's End, yeah. The World's yeah. End. Yeah, full points around. It's Shaun of the Dead, Hot Buzz, and The World's End. Yep, okay. Question number 20. Speaking of the end of the world, on November 20th, 1983... ABC aired a made-for-TV movie about an international dispute that devolves into full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
The film, starring Jason Robards, John Lithgow, and, naturally, Steve Gutenberg, was seen by over 100 million viewers, including a whole generation of terrified elementary school kids like myself, making it one of the highest-rated non-sports TV events of all time. What was the three-word title of this film, which one critic called very possibly the bleakest TV movie ever broadcast? I think I know it because at Blockbuster, we used to have this, and um, and it's really bad. And um, the only reason I know it is because there was a movie released with um, Dennis Quaid and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal that had part of the title in it, um, and that was The Day After Tomorrow, uh, which was too many days forward i believe it's the day after and i wrote how we died (laughs) (laughs) um i uh was afraid this might be a little bit before your time uh but since it was uh, such a big sort of a tv event and is important in tv history i thought i'd ask anyway and i'm pleased to uh, hear that one team got the correct Mm. answer which is the day after yeah so you said it uh, very nice pull now ring a bell well, at least we ended somewhat strong. Yeah, you yeah. ended the way we started, with three. So we had uh, gained the lead by the middle of that round, and uh, we lost it by the end. Uh, but it's a very tight game. 115 for the Field of Creams, 110 for Ice and Fire. Ooh, might be one of our tightest games. All right, so you guys want some categories for the final round? Yeah. Yes, please. Lay it on me. Your categories are how the hell, hockey, words, Elvis, and 1960s counterculture. After some talking, the wagers have been locked. Okay, question one. How the hell? Boy mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, is currently one of 476 contenders vying for the Democratic Party nomination for president. How the hell do you spell Buttigieg anyway? Number two, hockey. Before a recent redesign, which Canadian banknote featured a picture of kids playing ice hockey? Number three, words. The official Scrabble dictionary was recently expanded to make room for approximately 300 new words, including what five-letter term defined as to dance while shaking the buttocks while squatting? Number four, Elvis. About which baroness did Elvis Costello sing the following lyrics? There's one thing I'd know. I'd like to live long enough to save her. That's when they finally put you in the ground. I'll stand on your grave and tramp the dirt down. He finally got his wish in 2013. Hmm. And question number five, 1960s counterculture. Which retail store, located at 94 Baker Street in London, opened on December 7th, 1967, and closed on July 31st, 1968. After our discussions, the answers for these are locked in. All right, question one. Uh, So Pete Buttigieg, how how the hell do you spell his name? Okay, we'll start. Uh, We wagered a big 30 on this one. Um, Both me and Jeff kind of independently wrote down our best guesses on the spelling, and we both put B-U-T-T-E-G-I-E-G. Uh, yeah, Taylor and I wagered five on this one. A uh, big fan of this guy. like uh like the way he carries himself, and especially uh, the video of him doing a West Wing walk, uh, his new offices. And I believe his name is spelled B-U-T-T-I-G-I-E-G. Well, in this case, the eyes have it, because it's B-U-T-T-I-G-I-E-G. Yep, that was the only matter of discussion that me and Jeff had, and we went the wrong way. All right, question number two. So uh, which Canadian banknote until recently featured a picture of kids playing ice hockey? We wagered 20 on this one, and I sort of felt like that was the five, so we said the five. Okay, and uh, we came in with uh, no other guess but the 10 itself. Um I thought uh, Alexander Hamilton, great founding father on the United States $10 bill. So we thought kids playing hockey, what better way to celebrate Canada than that, eh? Uh, That was pretty good, although uh, almost drifting into Father Guido Sarducci there. (laughs) (laughs) That is the uh, the $5 bill. Uh. All right, question three. 
Um, so which which word entered the Scrabble dictionary, dictionary uh, defined as to dance while shaking the buttocks while squatting? Uh, we bet 30 and we said twerk. Wow. Uh, yeah, luckily uh, we got this answer because Matt entered the studio this way from China. So uh, <laughs> it would be twerk. And we wagered five. Yeah, full points there. It is to twerk. And you could twerk on the wall too. It doesn't have to just it, be squatting. I feel like that definition yeah. isn't. You can definitely upside accurate. down twerk on the wall. Especially when you're night quilling and stuff. Yeah. You just, you just got to yeah. be careful. Don't wear shoes because otherwise you get those prints on the wall and they don't come out. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Ooh. Good tip. <laughs> well, and your hands get dirty if yeah. you're on a sticky dance floor. See? A lot of good good tips going on right here. All right, question four. Um, so which Baroness was Elvis Costello uh, singing about when he said uh, he'd like to stand on her grave and tramp the dirt down? Um, yeah, so Ice and Fire, um, we wagered zero on this one, but uh, you know the only Elvis Costello song we could think of that was about a woman, we said Allison. So we locked in Allison. Yeah, you could take it, Taylor, if you'd like. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we really had an answer, did we? I don't think we did. Uh, we, we wagered five. <laughs> I what a, what to, a move, Neil. I just wanted to <laughs> throw them under the wheel. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you would uh, if you'd come Tie, up with something. Tying them to the tracks. Uh, Trampling on his grave. Yeah, so we, we wagered five. Uh, we did not know this one. Uh, great misdirect by Dave uh, putting Elvis there. And we said uh, Baroness uh, uh, Ludif- Ludifisk. Mm. Ludifisk. Ludafisk von Cheez-It, since I'm sitting next to a box of Cheez-Its. There you go. You know, this was uh, written by Elvis Costello in the 80s about uh, a lady for whom he did not uh, have any warm place in his heart. Uh, the Iron Lady herself, Margaret Thatcher. Mm. Ah. As played by Meryl Streep. Yeah. Steven. All right, and the last one. Um, which retail store uh, located at 94 Baker Street in London uh, was open for approximately seven months or eight months in 1967 and 1968? Yeah, uh, we wagered zero on this one. This is the famous and classic uh, re- retail store, which has become famous over the years. Uh, Twerkington's. <laughs> Twerkingtons. Uh, we wagered zero. Uh, I think I, I knew this one, even though we, we didn't wager anything. Uh, just from my time studying there, I believe it's Compendium Books. So that's what we went with. No, this one is actually a, a store that uh, some famous celebrities opened and uh, immediately started losing bucket loads of cash and closed it as fast as they could. Um, this was opened by the Beatles. This was mm-hmm. the Beatles Apple Boutique oh, in wow. London, England. All right, looks like uh, the scores have been tabulated, and the field of creams, unfortunately, will not be the cream of the crop today. They gained five points, reaching 120, and uh, Ice and Fire coming back in that final round for a total of 130, and we are today's cream of the crop. Cream, the cream, yeah, the cream of the crop. Yeah, great game, guys. Uh, you know, our our uh, field of creams just uh, <laughs> dried out there at the end. And, oh, jeez. Yeah. We had a we had a good first a decent first round pretty good swing round and that last round just was the uh, the coup de gras a coup de gras if you will yes so. yes um, but uh, you know I appreciate you uh, supporting the show from all of us uh, on Patreon and uh, uh, we I know we've been trying to have you on the show for a really long time so I'm just glad you were able to join us yeah thanks a lot guys it was a lot of fun being here and uh, maybe another time and maybe more. Uh, questions I'll be able to help out with. So. <laughs> yes, of course. I know you said you, you might want to host a game as well. So if you ever put that together, we'll we'll gladly have you back. Um, For sure. Yeah. Uh, Dave, great questions. Yeah, awesome questions. Thanks very much. If you ever uh, host a game, I'd uh, love to come back. You can take your revenge on me. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. There was no Jean-Claude Van <laughs> Damme awesome. question today. Dave, not, not today. It. Yeah. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. All right. Well, well thank you very much for finding us and for being uh, our best dressed contestant uh, so far. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you to Matt for uh, Pogo sticking his way here just in time. I like to show up to do half the work. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Dave for that wonderful game. Thank you to both of you for being Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join them, go to patreon.com slash Triviality Podcast. Uh, join in on some great perks and uh, help out the show. And uh, for Jeff, Ken, Matt, Taylor, Dave, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. That was episode one, everybody. I'm aware. Was that the one that actually posted, or was it our test one? No, oh, that was episode our first one. one. Episode one. With the wonderful title of uh, 
It was a Too Fast, Too Furious pun, but I can't remember what it was. Two Pirates, Two Caribbean. That's what it was. Two Pirates, Two Caribbean. Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> look how look how far we've come. Look how far we've come. We've maybe gotten not, worse. Not too far. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I, I mean, it's it's. What you had, you guys had an episode called Punchy Teethy, which uh, <laughs> that's my favorite my favorite title to date. So uh, I might I think mine is Pocket King Quack. <laughs> <laughs>